Greetings, everyone. This is the Hipster Snack, and today we bring you another awesome episode of the Tomodachi Bros Podcast Season 3. With me today, of course, is Mr. Clockwork Fiction. PSA, don't download RAM. It's a trap. You That's true. This already. That is true facts. And also, Master Ditaku. You shouldn't also download me. That's also a trap. That is also <laughs> that is a big trap. I fell for it once. Took years to get them off my computer. Super frustrating. Talk about EXE. Wow. <laughs> I am in your folder stealing your RAMs. Oh no. No, not my RAMs. I need those. You also stole my bank account. That's true. Yeah. He did. It's true. Worst part about it is he didn't even buy anything nice. He literally spent my entire life savings on vintage tube socks. Just Nothing but socks. <laughs> and cog body pillows. At least you'll never be uncomfy. So now no, my apartment I, is just full of socks and cog body pillows. And I, I'm sitting in a fort made out of, out of body pillows. So <laughs> That checks out. And today, we are going back to our roots. Back to season one. Back to season two. Coming soon. Trademark. Patent pending. All rights reserved. LLC, LMAO. We're going to talk anime, the animes we love, the animes that were underappreciated, and we're not going to spend an hour talking about one. We're gonna we're gonna do this a little bit rapid fire. Uh, who would like to kick us off this fair evening? Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven Edge Runners is a good anime. Why don't you hey, tell us? Uh, about it? I know I that some people it. don't like the premise that it feels like the sto- the the um try not to spoil it too much uh, but the the premise of the story very uh or the, the thesis i'd say the th- maybe the thesis of the story uh kind of at the end is kind of like well what was this kind of whole point for the the whole point of the matter is that the city always wins i'll put it that way the city always wins no matter who you are no matter how geared out you are uh you you're, you're not going to live long in that in night city uh characters all really uh, called, i thought were all pretty good um story again uh has a, had a lot of twists and turns or a decent amount of twists and turns it was a little slow in the beginning as some will say and then it ramps up real quick i believe it's only like 10 episodes if i remember correctly uh right. i could probably pull up here but it's, it's a really short so they they try to establish because not everyone's going to know the lore of cyberpunk yeah so I was say, is this establish- tied into the game or is it, it its own is, story so it wasn't tied into the game per se until uh they released a patch that put a bunch of stuff in it uh, oh, a lot so of they the kind of car- added the anime to the game rather than the other way around to put it to put it in perspective uh it, there's a uh there is a crematorium i think that's what it's called or uh something of that nature uh where you have a lot of like little uh uh nooks where uh you put the ashes of uh dead uh dead people in i'm guessing as a family if you do that kind of thing and you could put a little like monument little monument or a little saying on the spot that they're are you in. talking about like a mausoleum mausoleum something like that i don't know oh i don't know these words uh <laughs> um and a lot of the characters from the anime who die are actually in there uh with their own little say with the little, little sayings uh and certain equipment you can find is a reference uh and certain skills are references to characters from the anime okay uh all in all i give it uh and it also has as some people will say that uh and some people put it that it wasn't very studio trigger of studio trigger or in this anime and to be perfectly honest this is the first anime i've ever watched of that and i thought it was pretty dang good so i don't know if i if i ever decide to watch gurn yeah, yeah. and some of their others if yeah, i, I not, if it's going to not not trigger <laughs> exactly well, pretty okay much. It, it okay it is but it isn't because it's a guy studio gynax thing but a lot of the people that were that made gurn Lagan went on to form studio trigger because basically gynax doesn't really do anything anymore they, they basically, basically just off. live off royalties from Eva, from Ava, and that's it. Because well, see, the they basically <laughs> haven't been relevant since. See, the thing is, though, is that they have uh, is that Ano 
formed his own studio, which is the one who's making Evangelion. And yet, like, Ime Ishii and his dudes, who, who basically were the, the, the brainchilds behind Gurren Lagan, formed Trigger. So that's the reason why Gurren Lagan seems so similar to things. But honestly, like, you owe it to yourself there, Clockwork, to actually sit down and actually watch Inferno Cop. I mean, the entire thing is <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Inferno Cop is should. outstanding. <laughs> uh, to kind of wrap it up, because I was kind of going everywhere, I'm going right. to put in a line. Story is good. Uh, a little slow in the beginning, but it ramps up very quick. Um, I thought for what uh, them representing what cyberpunk is, it is a really good cyberpunk story. Uh, when it comes to character development and everything, there is good. I think I believe there is good character development of the protagonist that they have chosen. Um, I know some people will say the ending kind of defeats the purpose. And once again, I don't believe that's true. I think it's still the the as I say the how the the overarching lore of cyberpunk and Night City is uh, characters. I did not have any pause with any of the characters. I thought they were all fine. Um, I. Uh, Let's see. Uh, st- uh, character story. Um, I'm not sure what else to rate this. I don't usually rate animes, as you can tell. I usually rate video I mean, games. I don't either. <laughs> so I don't even rate the video games I review. So it's like I get it. Yeah. Uh, and just overall. Uh, oh, there's also a ton of. It's, there's also a ton of what I would say is like, hey, I know where that location is in the game. Hey, I know where this location is, or what they're referencing, okay. or the sounds that they might be referencing. The the game and the anime are pretty entwined with each other when they came out um like i said there was no there was no tie to the anime until they put it all in of course when the anime came out and they added in the patch then they all right. kind of connected they all kind of connected everything together okay um and i believe it's funny too as i'm actually playing the game because i am playing i just started playing phantom liberty the new dlc i just finally got some time to do it between uh school and work and stuff like that um i was as i was going through this i realized that one of the characters that's actually still alive the enemy you do meet <laughs> the uh you do actually meet uh who is actually uh one of the later characters you meet in the anime and i was like oh i remember him i totally forgot he's actually here <laughs> all right I won't that, spoil anything about that, though. I mean, you got to remember, Cyberpunk has blood going back to, like, the late 70s when it was originally mm-hmm. a tabletop game. So it's it's cool that it's trying to, especially because of the, um, what's a nice way of putting this, lackluster response the game got upon its initial release. Uh, it's good to hear that it's making strides to get up there again, because Cyberpunk has long been the rival of my beloved Shadowrun. So I wouldn't. I also wouldn't say like there was there was the lukewarm reception. I've always liked the game, besides all the bugs and the missing content, <laughs> just the lore and the city itself. Like you could tell where the money, you could tell where the money went, pretty much in the game yeah, itself. Yeah, to to like the the shiny bits, not the yes. the bug fixing, not until later anyway. No, a lot the ton of oh. the bugs, a lot of the features that are missing, but the actual lore and the pre- presentation of the game is really, really nice. To be is, fair, I haven't played the game and I haven't watched the anime, so I cannot I cannot do the barbs outside of the very broad strokes. And, and maybe I owe it to myself to check it out. And to anybody who does listen, this is the perfect time to pick up the game. There's going to be probably some uh, patch fixing here and there, but they but with Phantom Liberty and 2.0 out, out uh, it's been out for a while now, uh, this is pretty much their end piece. They are going to be moving on to uh, a new Witcher game, actually, actually making a new Cyberpunk game too, too so there's going to be another one of that. There's going to be another one of those. Well, hopefully um, they learned their lessons. And they've already we'll said that there's going to be no more expansions or anything based on this one since the story of the game is a pretty definitive uh, ending, to, uh, pretty defendant ending in its own self okay that's fair all right no that that that's interesting i, w- I will have to investigate that i am i must admit my ignorance outside of uh my full i know a little bit to be fair uh for instance there's actually a villain in Shadowrun returns who is very loosely based on the original author of the original uh cyberpunk books as a, a little jab <laughs> Um, I forget which character it was. I'll have to look that up, but uh, a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, Master Ditaku, do you have one next? Uh, do I have an anime? She, okay, I guess, you know. <laughs> Ditaku just makes the say, okay face. 
let me tell you about this one little story that uh, all about how I, my my life got flipped, turned upside down. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, it's Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That anime is fantastic. No, see, it's not as good as the excellent anime Quarry in the House, but you know that that is the best anime ever. Uh, no, 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 no. King of the Hill is the best anime ever. Let's not get carried away now, good sir. No, well, you, you got me there. But um, here, here's a close, close favorite, and one okay. that I always stand for, um, which is uh, my my baby, Madaka Box. Which, speaking of. Studio Gainax, one of the last things they did before they basically fell off a cliff was do season one and two of uh, Madaka Box. And um, as much as, you know, people are going to call me a hypocrite, maybe not now, maybe in the future, maybe in some, you know, alternate split-off timeline, uh, because they're going to go, uh, Detector, you say so many things about postmodernism, and yet you like this one show, and the entire thing is basically just a postmodern shonen battle series. And it's like, yes, but you see, here's the thing. It doesn't, you know, just go, <laughs> Kamehameha, am I right, guys? See, we, we, we knew about the Kamehameha, but we didn't use it. Yeah, your, your expectations have been subverted. No, it's none of that. It, it basically acknowledges that it is, it, it flat out does acknowledge that it is shown in battle suits to the point that one of the villains, who basically is really the major person, if you could say that, uh, because, well, she's really not a person. She's more like, I, I, it, okay, what I, does anyone care if I actually explain or spoil what? what the entire deal with Hajimo Najimi is. You know what? I'm just going to put a blanket spoiler warning at the start of this episode, regardless. Um, just because we are going to be summarizing a lot of stuff, and sometimes there'll be spoilers, and sometimes there won't. Watch at your own risk. That's fair. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, I also didn't want to, uh, but for people who are you know talking, I also didn't want to spoil it, since it's a pretty new anime, and not everyone might have a chance to see it. So, Right. But yeah. Well, the entire thing is is basically the the overarching villain who basically is the one who um, propels effectively everything. The entire uh, the entire series is caught, happens because of her, uh, Ajima Dunjimi, who is uh, the founder of the Sandbox Academy that the entire story happens at. And is the entire reason why all these super powered individuals at this school is because of this woman who is somehow a was in a junior high as a student, but is also simultaneously 75 million people and also the basically the like guiding spirit of humanity who has been around like in humans ever since like the dawn of time. Is basically been like guiding life to to basically become intelligent and then to effectively like use their own intelligence to to you know shape the world around them. Um, and yeah, basically her entire thing is like she is aware that she is uh, one all powerful, but also is aware that as the villain of the story she cannot win against the main character, Madaka. Uh, so she effectively has to work through intermediaries in order to uh, try and win, because just at, even in her own words, Madaka is so overwhelmingly powerful as the protagonist that even I, with my 23 quadrillion, and her, she actually will go on and explain like, oh, yeah, I have, like, 23 quadrillion. And the number, each time she mentions it, will get bigger, which I think was really funny and is probably done on purpose. Um, it's like, oh, yeah, me with my, like, big number of abilities, I just could not win. Just because, you know, something would happen, you know, she's the, she's the main character, and I would lose, and that would be the end of it. Um, and so... 
that that's basically what propels the entire story is her trying to overcome the fact that she is the villain. Um, and, uh, well, she, she doesn't, she gets killed about two thirds of the way through, which, um, basically boils down, uh, another theory I had, which I've seen, which I honestly, I could not tell you if this is true or not, where basically the, the entire thing is, is that, uh, even though there are all these like really, really abstract powers that are being used, like, uh, there's, there's a guy, uh, who can just like, it, just erase things from existence. Um, there are people who can just, um, use Japanese puns in order to kill people, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why, uh, Madaka Box will never, ever come over to the U S because there is an entire series of superpowers, which rely on Japanese puns. So, uh, unfortunately, it's just one of those things, and you know, it'll forever be, you know, that really niche, obscure, like, hey, you know, you know, type of series. Um, and so, uh, what am I, what was I saying? Um, oh, yes. Okay. So, um, basically, even though there are all these powers, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that instead of it actually being like, you know, uh, this is what it comes to, you know, super power academy. It's actually just a bunch of weirdo autistic teenagers just LARPing with each other. Like there, there aren't in like any actual lasers or anything. It's, it's, I mean, even though they're supposedly superpowers, um, it, it's all very nebulous. And so, there, there is a strong theory that they're like, yeah, you know, it's just a bunch of LARPs. And um, this is kind of added with the fact that uh, Ajimu somehow is 75 million people and she dies somehow, but she's still around. And we know she's still around because a lot of her abilities and stuff actually work still. Um, on top of that, I mean, um, the entire uh, school is actually called just Sandbox Academy. What are sandboxes for? Play. So, you know, the, is it one way or the other? I don't know. And honestly, I think that's one of the coolest parts of Madaka Box. Um, but yeah, basically, it's like it is my one exception to the entire like postmodernism. It's just the utter cancer. It is a seductive cancer to popular media because everyone who tries to do it cannot do it. And like, I, I will, I, I hold Madaka box up as like, this is the one time that I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll let it slide this time. But you know, the professor and uh, the professor, definitely. I don't know if I really, you know, waxed poetically to clockwork about, Madaka box yet, but I know the professor's probably rolling his eyes and making a, a very, you know, intriguing motion with his uh, tail. No, 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 no. You see, that gesture was reserved for when we were in high school, and Ditaku, you know, young, fresh-faced baby Ditaku, runs over to me after dismounting his stegosaurus that he rides to school. It's like, okay, Snake, have you ever heard of Yu Yu Hakusho? And I was like dimly aware of its existence. And uh, to say young Ditaku was obsessed would be kind of like saying that Little Snack was obsessed with Beautiful Joe, because both are 100% true statements. Now, now Ditaku is going to roll over and the Beatles <laughs> die of cringe. <laughs> and while he's dying uh, of cringe, I will share my next anime and this one is one that's near and dear to my heart because it's it's really really touches upon the fabric of what it is to be a hipster see uh snack found this show called shinzo and shinzo is one of the myriad animes based upon journey to the west but instead 
of going, okay, so now there's three dudes and this one really nice dude, and they're going to travel together, and da-da-da-da-da. But that vague parallel is there, but it gets so much crazier. Okay, get this. The Earth's entire climate is changing radically due to nuclear war. So they're like, crap, we humans can't adapt to this terrible environment. So what we have to do what? is we have to create... What's that? Was it actually ever confirmed to be nuclear war? Because it just not like it said. Was it, it was very heavily implied. Age. It was implied yeah, it was that war age. was the catalyst, but we don't really know how, why, or what the changes were. Just that the world was changing, and it was becoming very fiercely inhospitable to humans. Well, yeah. So their solution to this quagmire was to create new humanity. New humanity came in the form of Enterans. The Enterans were... New humanity, if you will. Yes. The Enterans were half-human, half-animal hybrid creatures who would have some advantages of their animal counterpart alongside uh, human intelligence, or in some cases, roughly human intelligence, because the Enterans are also really dumb. Um, more on that in a minute. <laughs> so yeah, A lot of them really are. The, the, the series starts with Yakumo, who, as far as we can tell, is the last living, full-blooded human at all. I mean, she's the last woman, but there's like apparently no other humans, near as we can tell. Yakumo wakes up, and she is in this weird seahorse dragon ship thing that her father built uh, called Hakuba. And Hakuba is like, oh, okay, so here's the rundown. Everyone you know and love is dead. You've been in encapsulated to keep you safe from the Interran Wars, because what did the Interrans do once there was enough of them? Well, they started killing each other, of course. <laughs> like any good anime. So, anyway, the Interrans became incredibly tribalistic, usually banding together by broad family affiliation. The reptiles banded together, the birds banded together, the insects banded together, so on and so forth. And Hakuba's like, okay, that sucks, and that's bad, but get this. There's this place. It's called Shinzo. It is this place, the city, far to the west. If you go there, there will be other people. There will be peace. It is this great utopia, and you can live your life in peace among your people, away from all this war and violence. And she's like, great, that sounds awesome. I'm going to do precisely that. And along the way, she meets three very dim but well-meaning guys. The first is Musha, who is the Napoleon of the group, because he is short and very impulsive and very quick to anger. Um, but he totally has a thing for Yakumo, and thus kind of bends to her will like the little spineless noodle that he can be at times. And the thing is... Uh, Mushra and his two friends are hyper in Terrans. Now, this is where a thing the show does not explain well at all becomes hugely pivotal. Some in Terrans are like supercharged and they transform into hyper in Terrans who are like a completely different level altogether. Spoiler alert, there's a tier above it. It doesn't have a name, <laughs> but there's one above it and it becomes hugely important. So, Mushra basically turns into a Final Fantasy Dragoon and whips out a spear and just starts, like, murking dudes left and right. And here's the thing. If you kill an Interran, they return to their end card, which is basically a computer chip implanted into a card that has their personality, their memories, their everything. It's their soul, fundamentally. If you destroy the card, that Interran is gone forever. And they can never, ever come back. So at first, he is just murking them and just tearing them apart. He'll kill them, he slices up their cards, and Yakuma's like, no, don't do that, that's bad, because she's supposed to be the, the Buddhist monk. She's supposed to be above it all. So he's like, okay. okay. Yeah. He, he, uh, Mushra's like, okay, fair cop, and also if I keep the cards, I can then use their power by absorbing them temporarily in order to enhance my own abilities or to change them temporarily and kind of make them into my utility belt, and in return, I will not kill them. So, along the way, they meet Sago and Kutal. Sago is this weird vampire, not vampire. He, his transformed hyper state looks like a vampire, but he doesn't drink blood, he doesn't get hurt by the sun. It's just a motif. He's a goth kid. He's supposed to be 
he's supposed to be Sandy, the uh, the Sand Monk. Yeah. From uh, yeah, that that's his entire thing. Yeah, and he he's actually kind of a, just a well-meaning goober. Uh, he tries to pretend like he's all cool, but he, he's not. He's a dork. Uh, and then there's Kutal. Kutal is a big old cat man who transforms into a big old lion man. Um, who's basically egg shaped up until he transforms. <laughs> and uh, those three together realize that when pushed into a corner, they can merge together into this noble knight named Mushrombo. And Mushrombo is just insanely powerful. He has all these great abilities. And they're like, hey, this is our trump card. We can beat anybody with this. So they learn there are these seven Interran generals, and they basically rule the world. And one's for the insects, one's for the birds, one's for the lizards, et cetera, et cetera. And they just go around, and they're like, okay, we have to beat these generals. We beat the generals. We can take Yakumo to uh, Shinzo, and everything will be great. And we'll become her guardians. That's how what we're going to do. Yep. So they kill the insect guy. They kill uh, the reptile guy. And then they get to the bird. They get to the bird. And her name is Rusfine. And Rusfine is a big deal because Rusfine is insane and OP. And she's like, oh, you just thought you'd kill all the generals. Well, guess what? I'm not going to let you do that. And they're like, well, we can become Mushrambo. Like, what, sta- what chance do you have against us? And she's like, oh, yeah, that's a thing. The seventh and Terran general is the human and Terran Mushrambo. It's you. <laughs> you guys are the seventh and Terran general. And they're like, well, not only not only that, but the, the fact that her lieutenants are so strong that they actually take out two of the other Interran generals. Because yeah, the entire yes. Yes. Are, are aware of the, uh, the chips. And the entire thing is, is if you consume the chips as an Interran, you basically get stronger. Yep. And so that, that's, they've basically been Mega Man, uh, Mega Manning their the way across other Interrans yep. in order to power themselves up. Th- this guy, Lennon Curris, shows up. He's from the Bird Tribe. And he's like, I've killed like three of the other generals. I'm just going to eat their card and kill you as this huge demon monster. So they have to go full power. They have to use Mushrambo to kill him. And then Rusfine's like, oh, lol, joke's on you. I'm just going to eat him and everything that he's already eaten and turn into this weird space-time manipulating she-demon. And they're like, well... Okay, fair point, but we like, what are you going to do? And she's like, I'm literally going to rewrite history so that it suits my needs. And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, well, we didn't account for that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> what, what if we kill you? Oh, crap, I didn't think about that. Uh... So they do. They kill Rusfine, but the time warp still happens. The series resets mid-season. <laughs> it is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in an anime. I don't think any other show has ever done it like this. So Yakumo starts her journey again and ends up meeting Mushra. And along the way, she meets this girl. I think her name is Linka. I could be wrong. Um, and Linka's like, oh, I'm a human too, but I'm a lot younger than you. Well, no, she's not human. She's an Terran playing her for a fool and tries to assassinate her. And Mushra has to kill her, leading to a lot of misunderstandings and yada, yada. The series goes insane. The second season is already crazy just because of how it gets set up. And um, I'm going to tell you, the ending is deliberately ambiguous. And again, like I said, you're, you're listening at your own peril. Uh, in the ending, it's implied very heavily that Shinzo never existed. And that like Shinzo was more a spiritual or philosophical state of mind. And... Mushra just straight up gets murked, and he and Yakumo end the series like flying away as this, these soul entities, and they're like, "Oh, we can go to Shinzo now," and that's how the series ends. And I'm like, "You're kidding me!" After all that, like we have this terrible downer ending, and I mean, I guess in one way it's a downer ending, and in another way it kind of isn't. But it's like I was not ready for Shinzo. I saw it when I was fairly young, like it was on the um. Was it Jetix TV block? And I was like 13 when I finally got to watch the series front to back. And I'm just like, this show is insane. <laughs> just absolute insanity. And I love it. Shinzo is such a good, weird shonen fighting series. And it does its own thing. And it doesn't hesitate to just be like, okay, status quo, bam. I just flipped it upside down. Deal with it. Mm, so good. Love it. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I agree. So, who must be something I might need to watch? (laughs) Oh, no, it it is immensely entertaining. So, I wanted to ask because I actually have watched a couple things, but the thing is, though, is they're not within the anime scope they're more of western animation will that be allowed uh, yeah sure what the heck you've done a few conversation you did a few western so, shows for the podcast that, that's fun. so well it's it, it's it, people get picky about it so i want to make sure if i if i start throwing this stuff yeah. in i'm not going to get it, it's uh, pitchforks in my gut <laughs> nah, it's fine it's fine so i watch and this is what i don't mind spoiling too much because i doubt the i for the audience, like you already, you've already been warned, but the the current circle of people around here, I don't believe would enjoy this show that much, uh, mainly because I don't know how many of them like Ubisoft games. Uh, there is recently an animation that came out called Captain Laserhawk: The Blood Dragon Remix. Oh yeah, I saw I've- that about that. I was, uh, I first thought it was just going to be some animation about, say, just like, it's like some just kind of like new animation and stuff like that. It's actually, what if we just take Blood Dragon from Ubi- a Ubisoft game, Far Cry Blood Dragon, and just take as much Ubisoft IPs and just put them together in some really, really predictable, but zany, action-y nonsense is what I, is the best way of putting it. You have... Uh, the, the, the crux of it is the main character who I believe is from blood dragon is thrown in, uh, is thrown into a team under his, uh, and under his, uh, under duress of his head exploding from a bomb that was implanted inside of it. And he joins Jade from beyond good and evil, uh, a frog who is an assassin from assassin's creed. Don't ask why. Um, and uh oh my gosh i'm missing the uh was was there's a third character i can't my brain my brain stopped for a second just (laughs) saying that last (laughs) phrase uh (laughs) um oh the third character was also from beyond good evil i apologize um they have rayman in there who is a they don't it wouldn't say a villain he's a side character who ends up kind of helping the other who kinds of help Actually, no, I'll put it this way. He goes on his own little adventure, to be perfectly honest. He's a, a spokesperson for the giant evil corporation kind of thing. And he turns turns and pretty much just like goes against them at the end in the most bizarre fashion. Uh, you probably have seen at least one or two pictures of him in a very uh, promiscuous uh, activities, uh, if you haven't already. Uh, it is, as one as one person put it, he, did, he was not intoxicated enough to watch what we were watching just because of how in the of how the story and all the characters just how it all is portrayed and everything um there's also it goes from western animation and they also do a lot of what i think is really cool is um animation changes there's a section where it goes turns into literally turns into contra (laughs) <laughs> it's just a Contra and then a like 2D fighter. And then there's a spot where it turns into almost like an a top down metal gear uh, section. Uh, they have a section where they go and have like a grainy, but all the characters are live action. And when they're doing some kind of like a VR simulation type thing, it's, it is, it I would put it in the, I would put it in the camp of you watch this we don't have anything else to watch and you're looking just for a wild ride that you know is probably not great but you know but it, you you want a good laugh out of it <laughs> hmm. all right um well and then the other one i have watched uh i've actually fully watched the entire castlevania and castlevania nocturne series but i'll let someone else uh take over they want to if they have something else to talk about too uh, do you talk about? Honestly, uh, I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't know. I didn't was not super uh, thrilled with uh, Castlevania. I thought the first two seasons were good, but um, honestly, I just, I don't know the, the way that it went from you know, uh, oh, here's you know three ragtag heroes who are going to you know fight Dracula to you know. Hi, I'm Carmilla, and I'm going to steal Dracula's power, and, you know, I'm going to explain to you why, you know, everything you like is wrong. It's like, what? This is not Castlevania. 
This is not. Given that this Camilla not was basically the biggest Dracula fangirl on Earth, which was entirely the point of Circle of the Moon. Yeah. So, so like, just, yeah. Have you actually, have you guys watched uh, Nocturne at all? Just no. for, okay. Um, I say out of the three, it's probably the weakest in terms of probably lore wise and stuff like that. Story wise, it was all right. Um, I think there was a, lot, a little bit of a, what I'll say preach in it, unfortunately, that did seep a decent amount into it of a couple of things that I was kind of like, okay, I get where we're trying to go with this. This doesn't feel a lot of Castlevania though. Oh, in the sense, uh, the amount of the amount of we're we're setting into this. I could, I know some people would be like, well, there's a reason. Like, I yes, but someone who had never, who barely played Castlevania, and I had a I had a, a friend who knows Castlevania talk to me about, about it. It was it's not a it was not a very very good representation. Um, the combat and the animation, everything was great. Um, and it was really and it was really fun. Uh, my one issue. I think, and I it could be just because of how it is. Maybe I was is that I didn't feel like in any of the, except for maybe like the one or two real fights, is that the the main heroes actually struggle in many ways. Like they struggle to fight certain things, yes, but I I didn't feel there was a real like sense of oh man they might actually die. <laughs> Uh, from the uh, at least from the first, uh, uh, from at least from the uh, the third one, um, I know the first, uh, the first one and two. Uh, I think I, I it's been a minute since I watched those. I don't remember how. I don't remember as many people who die or get close to death at least. But I know that there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of tension in the fights and certain things. Just a lot of of like you know like oh this happened or maybe someone got away. So what's gonna how is this going to end up turning or uh, uh, makes it making a mess of something they're going to get into next? I mean, the, the thing with Nocturne and the thing that, that kind of irritated me, I, I get why they started with Trevor because chronologically his story is very early in the timeline. And with that, you know, it makes sense. Castlevania three was not only a great game, it was really early chronologically in release order and in story order. So that makes sense. Now I'm going to say they did my boy grant dirty. Okay. When I beat Castlevania three, I had Sypha because you can only have one of them, but grant was still there. Super unfair. They didn't include him a little salty about that. Not going to lie. The later half of the first Castlevania series struggled because it was trying to make a deeper story out of games with very little plot. Curse of Darkness and Castlevania 3 are not complicated stories. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, the weird modern politics perspective was dumb. And honestly, by the time they were doing the Curse of Darkness stuff, I was like, yeah, I'm over it. <laughs> It's kind of lame because I played Curse of Darkness because Curse of Darkness has great mechanical things. Story-wise, it's not significant at all. Then they went to uh, the Richter games, Dracula X and Symphony of the Night. They did that because Symphony of the Night's really popular, not because it was next chronologically or next you know, in historical significance. No, they did it because people played Symphony of the Night and they wanted to do what was popular. And I feel that was a bit of a misstep for them. Don't get me wrong. Richter is one of the five great Belmonts. Okay. I, I played Dracula X. I played Symphony of the Night. Cool. Cool. All right. Now, uh, they really missed a one golden opportunity because what they should have done, if they wanted to start with Trevor, cool, start with Trevor. Then they should have gone back and done Leon. And the reason being is Trevor was the broken hero who had to pull himself together and make things right. Then they could have been, okay, here's the broken hero. Now we're going to have the unambiguously good hero, which was Leon. Instead, they went for Richter. And Richter is just an emotional basket case. The whole thing is like, he trained his whole life to be Dracula, and then he did. And then he was like, well, crap, now what do I do with myself? And he goes a little nuts, hence Symphony of the Night happens. And honestly, <laughs> it's one of those bits of Castlevania lore that I think is a little dumb, I'm going to be honest, and it kind of lowers my, my estimation of Richter. 
Um, and then one of my friends uh, who did see Nocturne is like, oh, Juiced shows up. And I'm like, Juice showed up in one game. <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> he showed up in one GBA game and in the whip crash in Portrait of Ruin. No one cares about Juiced Belmont. <laughs> and- I was about to say, um, I think, didn't you... When you heard about that, I remember you you getting really angry because you're like, "Yeah, the one uh, not not angry, boy, incredulous might be the word." <laughs> the one female Belmont that like Ega likes to pretend doesn't didn't happen had more. Uh, she had was, like was more like story movie. than him, yeah, because she was she was in um, one of the Game Boy games, and she was supposed to be the lead in the Dreamcast. Uh, Castlevania game, which got canceled before it was released. Um, and the, the big sticking point there is if there had been a female Belmont, her children would not have been Belmonts. So they've largely danced around that topic. Um, I mean, chronologically, by that point, we already knew that you know Richter would happen later. And obviously, we now have uh, not Ega the Belmont in Julius. So... Yeah, I, I think the Castlevania, the Castlevania anime can fix itself, but it needs to look very deep within its soul and ask, are we writing these characters because it's authentic to the source material, or are we writing these particular characters because we like these characters that are much uh, easier to write, because the cynic and the neurotic guy are easier to write than the unambiguously just heroes like Leon and Julius. Just saying, I'd watch an anime if it was based on Aria of Sorrow. They did leave the last one on a cliffhanger, which um, I thought was fine, uh, at least for for what it's regarded to, but I'm not sure where they're going to go on from it. Um, I uh, The friend I watched it with when I talked to him about well, I was talking to him kind of like, I mean, I wonder how strong this uh, main boss is. It's like, it's nothing against Dracula. It was it was terrible after Dracula went away. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> like, and that is, I mean, that is kind of the issue, is it not? Um, I, I guess it depends on if Circle of the Moon is still canon or not. Because <laughs> uh, there was a plot point where it's like, oh, Dracula can only be revived every 100 years. Um, which limits how many Belmonts there can be. But if Circle of the Moon is canon, that's not a concern anymore. And if you do the ritual, you can summon him an unlimited number of times. But there was a very long stretch of time where Circle of the Moon was not considered canon. So, yeah. Yeah. How many people here have played Circle of the Moon? (laughs) Let's start there. Uh, I, I can't say that I have, so... I mean... I have, but I'm a nerd. So I've played a little bit of Castlevania games here and there, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I think my most one I played was on a PSP. Yeah, and that was so that way I could play that and also uh, uh, Symphony of, of the Night. Yeah, Rondo of Blood. Okay, so that's that's because it also has Symphony X. of the Night on it, which everybody always told me was the game to play. <laughs> I'm not saying some. Okay, let me be clear for anyone in the comment section. Very angrily writing a five-page thesis on how wrong I am. Symphony of the Night and Dracula X are good games, okay? But um, I would rather play Super Castlevania Four over Dracula X, and there are several Metroidvanias I'd rather play than Symphony of the Night. Um, there's just better versions of them. I get why they're liked, but I respectfully disagree with your opinion. <laughs> there's better examples of these genres elsewhere. Symphony of the Night's only heralded as this big deal because it was the first Metroidvania in Castlevania, and Dracula X only gets it because Richter is in it. So, off my soapbox now. <laughs> yeah, but that's pretty much what I had to say about those two. Um, I don't know a lot about Castlevania, so I can't really speak on I can't really speak on the lore and everything like that. I just thought the uh, the original Castlevania series they had, I think, is in essence of just a better animated series than the, the first current one. At least how yeah. they show, at least how they're presenting it. Um, just on a couple of just on a on a few merits. Uh, I just feel that everything in a bit is fine, but weaker. The story definitely is a bit weaker as well. Right. And, uh, 
which is not say much. It could, they could, you know, next season could save it. I don't know. I do like, I do think the, the, I do think the the air of the 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 big bad is uh, pretty cool, actually. But I uh, at least in this uh, in the turn of events, but I right. can't say the same for every for everything else that kind of happened. Uh, I'll put a little bit of a spoiler in here. I the only reason uh, I can't remember the Balmont's name that's actually supposed to be a Nocturne uh, is because Richter. there is a there, Richter, there is a day there is a Deus Ex Machina moment kind of kind of in it, or like a DBZ uh, power up moment as well, as you could say. And I was kind of like, "All right, we're going that path. We could do that." <laughs> yeah, I guess fair. That's fair. All right, Dutaku, you what? control the floor. Well, you see, now this is this is now we have to explain why uh, my my doodle is looking at me now. <laughs> I guess he's waiting for me to say something. Um, you know, this is the reason why we need to explain why my Twitter should not be allowed to talk about entertainment. It, Entertainment should not care about Twitter. Basically, Twitter is its own thing. It's it's you know if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But if we're gonna throw really opinions sh- out there, t- Twitter should be like where everybody goes to yell and scream in a in a empty room, and they come back out and then they return to normal society. Nothing should ever be. Nothing should really ever be. It taken never seriously. It on doesn't Twitter actually broadcast your message. Like your message only shows up in your timeline and literally no one else's. <laughs> Would that not be superior? I mean, I mean it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> That'd, I mean, that would probably work too. a lot better than how they're uh, what they're doing because like True. people will put stuff on there and go, oh no, maybe that was a bad idea. Eight thousand replies in, that was definitely a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, hmm. I get that. Uh, uh, did you have an anime to talk about, Totaku, or another one? Um, I mean, not really. Um, I, I. I mean, I could talk about anime all day. I, I, it's one of those things that I just have really loved ever since I was a very, very small little pugum. Um, I think I'll say this, and it's I'll say this on my end is that I do want to watch more anime. There's a lot that I haven't seen. It's just time. There's not a lot of time, and my main focus is more on video games, generally speaking. Um, I do want to watch some more series and everything. Since I, uh, most of the series I've finished are old and not current my one issue is that out of the anime circle that i hang out with uh outside of the bros uh everything that seems to come out that everybody is watching is an isekai and i am sick and tired of isekais i'm gonna be perfectly honest it's like is this new series this new series like oh yeah there's like six of them out and i'm like why well, Why can't we do something different you, you see clockwork <laughs> it's because back in the 70s and 80s you know, whenever someone was about to get hit by a truck, a tokusatsu hero jumped in and rescued them. And then they stopped making manly heroes in the 90s. And so now everyone's just getting hit by the truck. And now they're dying. <laughs> and heaven was so overwhelmed by the influx of new blood. They were just like, okay, look, we can't handle all you all at the same time. So we're going to send a few of you back. And, you know, we'll make it fun for you. That way you don't have to, like, have bad things. Like taxes and big government. So we'll send you like fantasy world where things are more simple. And we'll also <laughs> conveniently brush over things like the fact that the bacteria is different in that world and would definitely get you super sick. But hey, we're going to ignore all that. You're going to have fun. You're going to find the most boring woman in the universe and she's going to instantly fall in love with you even though you have no personality. Bang, boom, boom. Genre is born. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I have now explained to you the how and why. You're welcome. Uh, I know there are certain animes, that, more mainstream animes I haven't watched. Uh, I have a friend who has been yelling at me that I need to watch uh, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex for oh, quite Ghost a while in the now. Shell. Go- okay, out of all of the Ghost in the Shell series, even the manga, I would argue standalone complex is probably the best, especially considering the, the overarching plot. Well, do you want to be spoiled? 
No, I would prefer not to be so because that's literally I think the next. So the the, the whole crux oh, of my right. conversation is what I'm probably so, going to be watching next is probably going to be Ghost of the Shield Hello Complex. Okay, so okay I okay, prefer okay. not to be spoiled on that one. So okay, all right, it. all right, all right. Okay, I'll say this. I'll say this to uh, to to wet your appetite. Man. Okay, um, you know those you know those uh, drones that Cog was really fond of in uh, Shadowrun. Yes. You know, like the big the spider tanks. Basically, yeah. the main character, uh, Motoko Kusanagi, she effectively gets those like as her best friend because they become self aware. Don't aren't they like the kind of the mascot of the entire series too? Like, I could just want to see them on like commercials and stuff like that for the yeah. Anime they they the basically well. have become the mascot character of uh, Ghost in the Shell now. Even though I don't think that they were they were basically made for standalone complex. But uh, I want to say um, the uh, the mangaka who who like conceived of it was like oh okay and, and just kind of incorporated them into future Ghost in the Shells. But, also, uh, the, the Katsukomas are are awesome. They are one of the best points of that series. Also, I wanted to mention is that I know I do usually like to watch stuff in um, sequence so that way I understand what's going on or at least I can kind of get an idea. I know that's not always the best because I know that a lot of people told me you should if you like Max you should watch Gundam and I'm like okay cool so I just watched the first Gundam and everyone goes uh probably not that one you might want to go up a little bit so that no. one was made in like oh, no no <laughs> start with UC Gundam go forward chronologically. Once you finish Double Zeta, you can start branching out into the other timelines. But do it right. So that's what I mean, though. Is that that's what that's exactly what I'm talking about, though. Is that like some people will say, like, like you should watch where like the branching out starts happening, and but not like the first one because the first one is so old. And like, no, those people don't actually. (laughs) No, those people do not like Gundam. Those are people who watch Gundam Seed or Gundam Wing, and they're like, "Eh, "I'm such a Gundam fan. I just love Gundam Seed Destiny." No, those people are dumb and wrong. And you start with Mobile Suit Gundam, then you go to Zeta Gundam, then you go to Double Zeta Gundam, then Shars Counterattack, then you can branch out and do everything else. All right. Uh, oh, so basically, what you're saying is you need to see, you need to watch um, the the first like versions of what you call it. You you want you want him to watch uh, the basically Tomino's run of UC Gundam before he's allowed to watch like uh, everything else. Maybe, maybe your favorite is, one, G Gundam. G Gundam is, is fantastic, but I feel you see the the first couple UC series. I think are must watches because the themes and motifs that they establish are pretty much omnipresent in almost every Gundam series proceeding thereafter. And I feel like you cheapen yourself out of the experience lacking that. Even if, okay, I'm just going to say it. Mobile Suit Gundam is World War One in space and Zeta Gundam's World War Two in space, but it's still really good, really depressing, and really good. You know, I want to say something, but. <laughs> when you're when you're right, you're right. <laughs> it is like it is it it is, and like that's the whole thing is like when you start getting into the spinoffs, you get into these really like different kinds of stories and different kinds of storytelling, and those are all good. But I you should see at the very least those three series and movie, and then go nuts with everything else. That's my advice. Um, well, the, the main thing I wanted to, uh, ask was because I know there was something, there were a, mo- a movie or two before Ghost in the Shell standalone complex and people told me there, to stay away from that and just watch standalone complex first. Okay. Yeah. There's a reason for that. First off, it basically, uh, the movie follows the original manga and, uh, standalone complex basically assumes that yes, it's the same setting. But the movie, because the movie basically ends in kind of, kind of, sort of killing the main character, uh, kind of. But so, but that doesn't happen in standalone. So yeah, it, you really shouldn't watch the first two movies. Uh, they're they're not necessary to really like appreciate standalone complex. Okay. 
<clears throat> but yeah, that's what I was probably going to be watching next once I get uh for once I get some free time. Okay, I'm was going to be that. Uh, any of you guys are going to be watching anything specifically or looking or kind of have on your your next to watch list you're looking at? Honestly, I need to get up back up on One Piece because um my uh my parents ironically actually really really liked the One Piece series and they so they turned to me for the for netflix one series and, like, not the anime yeah it doesn't mean the anime they did not watch a thousand no. episodes in like two weeks no no <laughs> no 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 they didn't. no they didn't and honestly it's, it's been a it's been a, a weird thing because i'm going through the manga <sighs> wow this is really good but at the same time oda really needs to learn that like you go you know, really needs to learn to like just kind of you know the mortal words of money just get on with it you know like I, yeah. I appreciate a lot of the his characterization, but it's like, dude, you've been doing this for like thirty years now. You you gotta like, come on, man. You gotta do something with it. Also, just gonna say it, hockey was probably a mistake. I don't know. I feel like hockey was a good idea, but yeah, it was very, very, very clear that it's like it was not something that he ever intended. So people are like, oh yeah, he. He intended it from the beginning. I'm like, no. No, he didn't. I don't think he did. He very clearly did not. Yeah, because there are certain points where he's like, uh, the, the, there's a point where like Blackbeard is fighting Ace, and he's like, oh, you got attacked. Yeah, it must feel weird to actually get hit because if you're a Loki, it murders you, you know, and never gotten hit. And it's like, yeah, but if hockey is like just a thing that, you know, happens with high-level pirates, like, both of them, wouldn't he have gotten hit before? But, yeah, that just kind of proves that hockey was just kind of a thing that they added on. Yep. Now, I'll tell you a fun one, because you reminded me, Clockwork. Uh, I have not really seen very much of Ghost in the Shell. I saw the live-action Hollywood movie, which was, like, all right. Um... But I did see one of its spinoffs, Real Drive, which is a slice of life story in the same universe. And it's just this really quirky story about a teen girl. The whole thing is like people can just dive into the internet using like an implant they have in their brain. But our main character doesn't have that. So she actually has like basically put on like a cooking pot over her head. (laughs) That's kind of what it looks like to me in order to use the internet. And she makes friends with this old guy who used to be a deep sea diver and he got wounded and couldn't do it anymore. But that was like his thing. His passion was like, Oh, I love being deep in the sea uh, and being like one with this like deep aquatic experience. And then because of her inability to dive into the internet, he discovers that he can. And he's like, Oh, it's kind of like deep sea diving, but I can do it in my own house. I don't have to be like in the ocean. And it's actually, it's really good. I think it's really underappreciated in terms of the ghost in the shell mythos. Is that the, is that the one thick girl that I, I yes. keep seeing? Uh, Hold on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hold on. The, yeah. Hold on the cyborg. And like, actually like most of the women in the series are really big. <laughs> Someone on staff was a man after my own heart. Or, I don't know, a woman after my own heart. That's possible, too. Um, all the girls are thick. Holon is thick. There's one lady who only shows up a few times. Her name's Patricia something. And she is just, like, big, period. Um, yeah, that added a certain je ne sais quoi for me. <laughs> Uh, but it's a good series. Like, Don't expect any kind of like huge, mind-boggling spy thriller sci-fi cyberpunk thing because that's not the kind of show it is it's very different but it is set in the same universe well i mean the, the funny thing is about it's set in the same universe yeah yeah it's set in the same universe as cyberpunk well, wait no, what as, as what? a ghost in no. the shell oh ghost is, oh sorry <laughs> like, i said brain. cyber cyberpunk lowercase as in the genre Okay, no, I'm sorry. Okay. My my brain like auto corrected it. I was no. just like, he's not thinking what I'm thinking. He's thinking. No, <laughs> thinking. <laughs> no. no. Okay. No, no. What you need to do, clockwork, is you need to go down to the bookstore and you need to get William Gibson's Neuromancer and realize cyberpunk basically 
is uh, certain enterprising individuals in the 1980s going, wow, I sure do love Neuromancer. I'm just going to take this file. I'm going to file off the serial numbers. Ah, it's a new thing now. Cyberpunk. And then someone else did the same yeah. thing, but was like, hey, you know what else I really like? Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm just going to put them in a blender and put it on puree. And hey, look, Shadowrun. No, it's basically someone, it's the old uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups commercial. It's just somebody <laughs> with a neuromancer and someone with Lord of the Rings. And they're like, ah, you got my Lord of the Rings, you're a neuromancer. Ah, you got my neuromancer, you're my Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that run. That, that, that's good. I like that. Um, hey. As for stuff I need to watch, I have a couple different things on my, on my radar that I do need to sit down and watch. Now, I'll tell you a funny one. One I had a, a bit of a nostalgia trip the other day because uh, not too long ago, I rediscovered Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa, a uh, early 90s animated series that ran for two seasons. And it's really, really? good. Yeah, uh, it's really good. And it shares some yeah, of its I, creative. Hmm? Oh, I was just going to say, like, after we finished the uh, arcade game, yeah, uh, I, I've been meaning to get back to it. And it's only ran two seasons, so really this has been my laziness and lack of time biting me. And also the convenient website that I used to stream everything off of died. Sucks. Uh, so that set me back a little bit. I need to sit down and finish watching the whole series uh, because it's weirdly good, especially the first season. Um, mm. Like, There's not many Westerns anymore, and I feel that's a bit of a shame. Oh. Um. And I guess you got to get back to, you know, Wizards of Houston. There. I, I do, but Wizards of Houston isn't really a Western. Um, Wizards of Houston is urban fantasy. And I mean, <laughs> like, yes and no. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, I also have Neuromancer on my, like, one of my first books I get when I decided to get my Audible subscription. So, oh, it was definitely funny that you brought that up because I do, gen I do have that on there. You know what? Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you another anime clockwork. Uh, Grenadier. Uh, Grenadier <laughs> is insane. <laughs> and it's what happens if you combine elements of Journey from the West Journey to the West and spaghetti westerns, and slam them together and have a smoking hot blonde as your main character. Go watch it; it's good. It's not very long, but it's really good. Uh oh, 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 I can I tell mean, by the, the I can tell by an image or two. I know where I'm getting into. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's really oh, good. Like it, it's like it's yeah, one of those series that's kind of infamous because it's more known for its fan service moments. But if you go in and just like okay, I just want a, a good action comedy. Just enjoy it. It's good. I promise you, it's good. All right. Yeah, I was I'll about to say, if, it. it's the, <laughs> if it's the GIF that I, I think it is, because it's pretty much, I can guarantee you, it's the GIF that basically caused uh, the professor and I to actually go, wait a second, what show is this? And then we're like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. It, it is, and it was because you showed me that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to see how this is. And then I watch it, and I'm like, this show is super underrated. It's actually super good. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's a, cow, a, 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 a gunslinging woman and a samurai guy team up to bring peace and justice to what, Space Wild West. Not space wild west, basically like magical. Mag west. Magical, yeah. No, I mean you're right. You're you're thinking of wild arms. <laughs> I am. There. I'm getting getting a little bit off on a tangent. That show is also freaking weird. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, you know, I, I as much as I like wild arms, Twilight Venom, it's like it was. I I honestly like. I really felt like it needed more explanation than just. You know, like we're uh, we're bounty hunters in, in Wild West. JK, we're in space now. JK, we're on a prison world. JK, now everyone is like dead. 
it, it had an identity crisis. The first season of the show is like, ha ha, wacky hijinks. It's all kind of very loosely tied together, and the overarching plot doesn't really matter. And we're just going around, and we're trying to be con men, but we're too nice to really be con men, so we end up like helping more people than we swindle. Season two throws all that away. It's like, no, there's this like dark, overarching story, and the government's evil, and it's also this planet is not Earth, it's in space, and then we have this super huge anti-town weapon called Twilight Venom. And I'm like, what happened? Did you fire the writing staff halfway through your series? This is not the same show. Oh, yeah, by the way, they also are hinting that there's like an ancient demonic space evil that's like manipulating everyone into using the Twilight Venom. Yeah. But we don't really mention it except for like the last episode where they're like the bad guy when we're finally like confronting the bad the bad guy and she's like, Yes, I, you know, am doing this all in order to get my husband back. Oh yeah, by the way, thanks for your help, evil space demon dog. No problem. Ah, it's you, Space Demon Dog. Yes, it was I. It was I the whole any time. Explanation? Any, any explanation of Season Lord? No, this is the last episode. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> Good show. Really questionable ending. <laughs> yeah. I mean, never mind the entire, like, I'm going to sacrifice myself to save you. No. <laughs> How could you, Space Hamster? You were the best character. No, not, not Space Hamster. He was Exposition Weasel. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the, the female Exposition oh, Weasel. You're right. The female Exposition Weasel becomes Exposition Weasel Jesus. And then the, the male Exposition Weasel has to sacrifice himself. And well, no, it's because she dies and then she comes back and she's like, oh, yeah, Exposi Mr. Exposition Weasel, by the way, I, I'm alive again. He's like, oh, thank God. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm also a virgin again. He's like, what? Oh, like, what? yeah, that that was one of the weirdest moments in the entire thing in a show littered with really weird things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I the first season's really good though. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'll say this. I definitely enjoyed myself, but yeah, it was It really was a heck show. of a ride. It's just the ending is so bizarre. Like I like it legit feels like it was a different writing staff. Yeah, honestly, it it did seem in a lot of ways like uh like the first season and the second season had like an entirely different writing staff to it. Yeah. Just like the same characters are there, but it goes so wildly off the rails by comparison. So no, that, that's fair. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. I like it. I have it the full series DVD box set. So, I mean, I must've liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, Okay, this is one of those weird stories that's going to date me a bit, so, so let me give it a little bit of context. Cog owned a copy of Wild Arms 3. We played it together, and I'm like, this is really cool. I really like this. So I go to the movie rental store with my parents, because I'm older than dirt, and movie rental stores still existed. And there, I was like, huh, I wonder what's in the anime section. And I see... Wild Arms. And it had the first two DVDs of the series. And I'm like, ah, oh, dude, that's so cool. And so I watched them. And I'm like, oh, this is really good. This is really fun action comedy. And I could not find the remaining four DVDs that made up the series. So as an adult snack, I go online and I'm like, oh, there's a box set. Perfect. It's my opportunity to watch it. And then other things got in the way and I never did finish the series. And then Yutaku and I were living together for a while. And I'm like, hey, we need to finish this. We need to do this justice. We watched it all the way through in the span of like a week and a half. And we got to the ending and we're like, that was good. Yes. Yes. That was weird. Yes. Also, yes. So, yeah, that was, that was my weird story with this anime. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Which is funny much. because Wild Arms 3 was actually my first Wild Arms game as well. <laughs> yeah. I went back and played. Um, one, two, and four later on. But yeah, 
Um, three was my first, and the anime is really weird. Mm. That's my takeaway. Was it good though? Like, was it like? Oh yeah. Would no, you it recommend was, it, or would it be something that it you was know, super you entertaining? I would recommend watching yeah. it just for its own sake, and, and to see just how weird the ending actually is. And you guys, like, you probably are like, no, it can't be that weird. No, watch the series, okay? <laughs> watch the series, and okay. when you're finished, yeah. come back to us and be like, yeah, okay, that was super weird. <laughs> okay, one of my one of my favorite one of my favorite books of all time is Fearsome Engine, which basically uh, I would argue pulls the same thing, where it's like it starts out and you think it's a uh, you kind of think it's a fantasy series, but then it basically is like, JK, we're in space now. And it, it effectively just was like, oh, okay, we've been in science fiction this whole time. That's, uh, all right, okay, you, you got me, you got me on that one. And, and that's basically like a lot of the weirdness kind of revolves around. It's not done the most elegant of ways. But thinking about it, I'm like, no, no, that makes sense. It's just, yeah, you could have done it better. <laughs> I don't know. Also Am I off base there? there? No, that sounds right to me. Small little gaming fun fact. If you do like Wild Arms, uh, the Wild Arms creator is making a game called Armed Fantasia that's going to be on the Switch. Uh, I don't know if there's a release date for it, but I kind of found it when I was looking at Wild Arms. <laughs> Hey, you know, huh. even if it's not Wild Arms proper, the fact that any kind of similar thing is being made is still super cool to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm just surprised that we haven't gotten a, uh, a you know, snack uh, cowboy, space cowboy game, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I might have ideas for that kind of thing. On itch.io soon, okay? <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, um, I'll tell you what. If, if, I, if I could make my ideal crazy indie game, let's just say you guys will know that my figurative thumbprints will be on it. You'll know. <laughs> You'll know. You'll know. What art by Zade Technician? <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it, but I was thinking it real hard. <laughs> Oh, okay, wait, wait, hold on. Would would said technician be your art guy, or would sets be your art guy? Okay, here's what I'm thinking. Zed technician will be the character designer. Sets will be the actual artist, and then I'm gonna have to get Mortis Ghost to help write the story. Oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be wild. And then I can already tell this is gonna be wild. I'm going to figure out how to revive the dead via the Necronomicon in order to get Kenji Ito to help me with the mechanics. Kenji Ito? Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, well, this is gonna be wild. <laughs> this is going to be good. D three D harder. <laughs> 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 oh boy Laura Laura it turns out you've been at a coma and now you have to fight against monkeys space monkeys that are actually Dracula <laughs> Dracula was just three monkeys in one <laughs> they're, they're space Dracula dragon monkeys with big bat wings they're <laughs> You know, it's not the weirdest thing that Kenji, you know, has ever done. Let's just say that. <laughs> you know, I'm just wait. I'm just saying we need to get a D2 uh, snack place just so people understand oh, God. how ridiculous. Uh, I mean, just the explanation that they give for like hunting. There, yeah, there's a hunting mini game, but it's like hunting. You consume the flesh, and the flesh you know, proves your power over the other animal. And that's how you gain energy. I'm like, I don't think that's how that works, but okay. No, it definitely does not work that way. But (laughs) yeah, that's, that's a topic for a different episode, I suppose. All right. So let's bring today's episode to a wrap. Was there uh, any final comments? I'm going to go in alphabetical order here with uh, clockwork. 
I should watch more anime. I just don't have the time for it right now. Uh, I, too much, uh, not enough, too much, uh, too much work, not enough, not enough playtime, and too many good video games out there right now, and too many uh, expansions coming out to uh, find out. But I will, at one point or another, will watch some. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel the same. Like between work and everything else, I, I get it. All right, uh, Master Yutaku. I need to watch more anime. I haven't become one with anime yet, so I need to watch more. <laughs> it, it's okay. You can vote for Ron Paul, and he'll make. Yeah, anime he hasn't. Real. He hasn't had. He hasn't uh, obtained the ability to just enter the anime he wants to yet. <laughs> He's not able to self isekai himself into the anime. Guys, I'm going to Ninja Scroll <laughs> later. <laughs> and Itaku was no, never seen. Going. What's that? So I'm not going. In, I'm not going to Ninja Scroll. I, I would. No, no, no. I see. I would be one of those random peasants that just gets killed. I, I, <laughs> no. Fair, fair. I'm not. I'm not sure what series I would want to go to. Huh, I have to think about that. One that won't kill you. Trust me. That's probably a good plan. <laughs> I'm going the Monster Rancher. No regrets. Oh, I'm going to go to Pop Team Epic. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. All right, and so this has been Clockwork Fiction, Ditaku, and, of course, your humble host, The Hipster Snack. Thank you for joining us for another awesome episode. Like, if you haven't already liked it, comment. Tell us what anime you think that we should check out, because we would love to hear your recommendations. And I swear, if you give me some normie crap like Haruhi, I'm just going to block you from the channel forever. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> subscribe if you haven't already subscribed because there's more like this every single week no exceptions and we will see you in the next one he's and, kidding he loves you <laughs> he's just there eh? not not kidding not joking <laughs> no <laughs>Thank you for listening to the Tomodachi Brothers Review Podcast, produced and recorded by The Hipster Snack, Ditaku, and Cog. Sound design and editing by executive producer Sean Taylor Brown with Cog Sound Engineering. Music written and performed by Sean Taylor Brown with Costas Voss of Core Insight Studio on the drums. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time.